thank you very much for joining uh, this uh, special uh, session of the uh, Human Rights Centre uh, seminar series here at the School of Law at uh, Queen's University Belfast. I'm delighted to be uh, joined by all of you and especially our speaker um, today, Professor Jessica White. Um, Jessica, we've asked Jessica to speak about her 2019 book, The Morals of the, the Market, Human Rights and the Rise of Neoliberalism. In this influential book, Professor White offers a deep, uh, you might say, a genealogical account of the historical, philosophical and political relationship between neoliberalism and uh, human rights. And while it engages with a number of critiques of human rights in the context of the history and practices of neoliberalism and stands alongside other important work uh, like Wendy Brown's and uh, uh, Simon Moyne. In my own, my own opinion, humble opinion, um, uh, Professor White's uh, work uh, transcends, uh, incorporates and engages and even contextualizes some of those other important uh, critiques. Professor uh, White um, is based at the School of Humanities and Languages uh, and Philosophy at the School of Law at the University of uh, South Wales. She is also an Australian Research Council uh, DECRA Fellow. Um, she's a political theorist whose work integrates political philosophy, intellectual history, and political economy to analyze contemporary forms of sovereignty, human rights, humanitarianism, and militarism. And her first monograph was uh, Catastrophe and Redemption, the political thought of uh, Giorgio Agamben, uh, published in 2013. So I've invited Professor White to speak to us for about 25 minutes, um, and then we'll proceed to a, uh, uh, an engagement and dialogue uh, with her ideas. And uh, I very much uh, look forward to all of your uh, contributions to that conversation. So I'll hand over now to uh, to Jessica. Thank you very very much for for joining us today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for the invitation. I wish that I could be actually joining you there in person. Instead, I'm speaking from Sydney. I'm on the unceded land of the Wongol people of the Eora Nation. Um, thank you all also for being here. I know that it's morning time there. It's seven thirty in the evening here. Now. Um, I have been asked to speak about my book, The Morals of the Market, so I'll do that. But I also thought if people are interested, we could talk about the period since that book came out and particularly the rise of various critiques of human rights that we've heard since then on the right as well as on the left. So I just want to start by reading a quote which is from the draft statement of aims of the neoliberal Montpelier Society. And it says... Any free society presupposes, in particular, a widely accepted moral code. The principles of this moral code should govern collective, no less than private action. Okay. In 1992, the Chicago School economist Milton Friedman was asked about the original purpose of the neoliberal Montpelleron Society, founded in 1947. There is no doubt, he replied, that its original purpose was to promote a classical liberal philosophy, that is, a free economy, a free society, socially, civilly, and in human rights. Coming from a thinker who described the regime of Chile's General, General Pinochet as an economic and political miracle, this reference to human rights seems out of place. After all, human rights NGOs came to prominence in the 1970s precisely for contesting the torture and shock treatment that accompanied neoliberal, neoliberalism in the Southern Cone. According to a dominant view, neoliberal emphases on competitive markets and austerity are self-evidently at odds with human rights. As a recent primer on human rights puts it, neoliberalism is one logic in the world today Neo human rights is the other. 
So today I've been asked to speak about my book, The Morals of the Market, Human Rights and, Neo and the Rise of Neoliberalism, which challenges this view by tracing the overlooked place of human rights in neoliberal efforts to challenge socialism and social democracy in the 20th century. Now, much has changed since the book is published. During the reign of Trump, Bolsonaro, Modi and other right-wing figures, critiques of human rights have intensified, including among certain neoliberals. And more recently, liberal internationalism has made a comeback, leaving Francis Fukuyama to revive his much-mocked end-of-history thesis, claiming in April of this year that the spirit of 1989 will live on and that we're about to see a new birth of freedom. Now, perhaps some of this will come up in the discussion, but for now, the morals of the market examines the historical as well as the conceptual relations between human rights and neoliberalism. It seeks to explain why these two revivals and reinventions of liberalism took place at the same time and why their trajectories have been so implicated with each other ever since. The book is framed by a double coincidence. It's often been noted that the widespread embrace of the language of human rights took place in the late 70s, just as governments also began to embrace neoliberalism. Attesting to this convergence, Friedman's 1976 Nobel Prize in Economics was followed the next year by Amnesty International's 1977 Nobel Peace Prize. Less well noted is the fact that in 1947, when the UN Commission on Human Rights began drafting an international bill of rights, a group of economists, philosophers and historians was gathered across the Atlantic in the Swiss Alpine village of Mont Pelerin to discuss the principles that could animate a new liberal order. The efforts of the first group resulted in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was conceived as a common standard of achievement for all peoples and all nations. The latter grouping founded the Mont Pelerin Society, which has been aptly described as the neoliberal thought collective. In 1947, the divergences between these two groupings were more significant than their convergences. While both were concerned with threats to human dignity and liberty in the wake of World War II, their solutions differed markedly. The human rights delegates adopted an extensive list of social and economic rights, while the neoliberals depicted state welfare and planning as totalitarian threats to Western civilization. When a distinctive and powerful version of human rights began to be advocated by NGOs and the US state 30 years later, earlier attempts to enshrine rights to housing, food, education and medical care were largely supplanted by a narrow focus on civil and political rights. This version of human rights became hegemonic alongside a neoliberal assault on both the welfare state and post-colonial attempts to restructure the international economy in the interests of greater global equality. Human rights became the dominant ideology of a period marked by the demise of revolutionary utopias and socialist politics and the belief succinctly expressed by Thatcher that there is no alternative. The economic transformations of this period were stark, from the rise of austerity and the retrenchment of state welfare provision to commodification of public services and growing indebtedness. Consequently, critics of neoliberalism homed in on its economic agenda, while critics of human rights largely confined themselves to challenging the belief in a stable human nature. Nonetheless, I contend that we can't understand why human rights and neoliberalism flourish together if we view neoliberalism simply as an economic doctrine. Now, neoliberalism in scholarship is commonly understood as an amoral economic ideology which subordinates all values to an economic rationality. In a powerful instance of this critique, Wendy Brown has argued that neoliberalism's economization of life configures the human, in her words, always, only, and everywhere as homo economicus. Elsewhere, Brown argues that despite its pragmatic reconciliation with neoconservatism in the United States, 
neoliberalism is expressly amoral at the level of both ends and means. And it's interesting to note that one of the things that's changed since my book is that Wendy Brown has actually published a subsequent book in which she's retracted that claim and has also traced some of the moral aspects of neoliberal thinking. But from the perspective of my work, such accounts of the amoral economism of neoliberalism miss the distinctive morality that was central to its rise. What distinguished the neoliberals of the 20th century from their 19th century precursors, I argue, was not a narrow understanding of the human as homo economicus, but the belief that a functioning competitive market required an adequate moral and legal foundation. Early neoliberal thinkers aimed to establish or revive a set of moral values that would secure social integration in a context of market competition. The founding statement of the Mont Pelerin Society makes this clear. Diagnosing a civilizational crisis characterized by the disappearance of the conditions for human dignity and threats to freedom of thought and expression, it states, and I quote, that these developments have been fostered by the growth of a view of history which denies all absolute moral standards. Rather than an external supplement or a pragmatic partner of neoliberalism, as Brown has argued, social conservatism, including explicit appeals to family values, Christianity and Western civilization, were foundational to the consolidation of organized neoliberalism in the mid 20th century. Far from reducing all of life to economics, I show that the neoliberals of the mid-20th century were deeply suspicious of the very idea of the economy. In his polemical 1944 critique of socialist planning, The Road to Serfdom, the founder of the Mont Pelerin Society, Friedrich Hayek, complained about his contemporaries' preoccupation with economic concerns. The values that rank lowest today and are dismissed as 19th century illusions, he argued, are the moral values, liberty and independence, truth and intellectual honesty, peace and democracy, and respect for the individual qua man instead of merely as the member of an organised group. Around the same time, the German neoliberal Wilhelm Röpke criticised the economism, which in his words, judges everything in relation to the economy and in terms of material productivity, making material and economic interests the centre of things. No doubt there are aspects of neoliberalism that support the charge of economisation. From the Austrian school economist Ludwig von Mises' argument that the market is a permanent election in which each dollar counts as a ballot, to the US public choice theorist James Buchanan's reconfiguring of politics as a sphere of self-maximizing individual competition, neoliberalism appears to be the extension of economic rationality to all areas of life. Yet, drawing on the ancient Greek origins of economics in oikonomia, the management of a household, the early neoliberals worried that conceiving of the overall social order as an economy licensed the belief that this order was governed by collective solidarity and had a single set of ends that could be managed by Keynesian or social democratic planners. This, they argued, was the very definition of totalitarianism and a threat to civilization itself. The competitive market they sought to revive was not simply a more efficient means of distributing resources, it was the basic institution of a moral and so-called civilised society and a necessary support for individual rights. From this perspective, for the neoliberals, the rise of socialism and social democracy was first of all a moral problem. Hayek provided one of the clearest neoliberal accounts of the morals of the market in his late work, Law, Legislation and Liberty. Invoking the fall of Rome and the thesis of its great historian Edward Gibbon, who attributed that fall to a decline in ancient virtue, Hayek warned that whether or not Gibbon was correct about Rome, there can be no doubt that moral and religious beliefs can destroy a civilization. For Hayek and those he brought together to form the Mont Pelerin Society, the demise of the morals that sustained a market order threatened their own civilization with destruction. Morals, in this context, referred both to sentiments about right and wrong action, 
and to the system of rules of conduct that guide the action of individuals. They were distinct from law in that they lacked coercive enforcement, but were nonetheless, he believed, crucial to the functioning of a market order. Now, this account of morals was deeply functionalist. The morals of the market, Hayek contended, function to sustain, sustain the only order that embraces nearly all mankind, the competitive market order. This order, he argued, required a moral framework that sanctioned wealth accumulation and inequality, promoted individual and familial responsibility, and supported the submission to the impersonal results of the market process at the expense of the deliberate pursuit of collectively formulated ends. Given that moral rules exist to support the market order, Hayek urged that, in his words, conduciveness to that order be accepted as a standard by which all particular institutions are judged. So this market conduciveness, this standard of whether or not institutions were conducive to competitive markets, gave the neoliberals a criterion for assessing claims to human rights, which was far more precise than a simple distinction between civil and political rights on the one hand and social and economic rights on the other. To the extent such claims supported market relations, the neoliberals actively promoted them. When claims for rights interfered with the competitive market by requiring state intervention and non-market forms of obligation and redistribution, they opposed them as though the fate of civilization depended on it. So in the book, I argue that in arguing for the virtues of the market, the neoliberals revived an older political argument for capitalism that was first identified by Albert Hirschman in his classic 1977 book, The Passions and the Interests. So there, Hirschman uncovered what he called the do commerce thesis, which he saw particularly in uh, figures like the Bar Baron de Montesquieu. Um, and Hirschman chose an epigraph from Montesquieu's The Spirit of the Laws for, sorry, a, a quote from that book for his own book's epigraph. It's fortunate for men to be in a situation where though their passions may prompt them to be wicked, they nevertheless have an interest in not being so. Now, Montesquieu, of course, wrote at a time when world trade was violent and dangerous, inseparable from colonial conquest and the slave trade. Yet it was only when this violence came home Hirschman argued, with the French Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, and the social dislocation of the Industrial Revolution, the belief in the sweetness of commerce lost its grip on the European imagination. By the 20th century, Hirschman concluded, no observer could still subscribe to this hopeful version of the pacifying market, and its subsequent defenders focused on its economic benefits borrowing from Adam Smith to valorise the increased productivity and efficiency made possible by the division of labour. In contrast to Hirschman's position, I argue that a version of this justification of capitalism was central to neoliberal thought in the inauspicious circumstances of the 20th century. For Hayek, who described his own position and project as doing for the 20th century what Montesquieu had done for the 18th, and for his neoliberal colleagues, the challenge was to revive the argument that a society coordinated through the competitive market would replace the coercion, conquest and conflict endemic to politics with voluntary, mutually beneficial, harmonious social relations. The tendency to view neoliberalism as the dominance of the economy over all other spheres of life has obscured its distinctive political argument for the market. Throughout the 20th century, neoliberals faulted socialism and social democracy for politicising distribution and replacing consensual market relationships between individuals with violent sectional conflicts over ends. The wars of the 20th century, they argued, were the inevitable, turn, inevitable consequence of the turn away from the market economy. Variants of Hirschman's thesis run through the argument of Hayek's mentor, von Mises, that if not for the greater productivity of the division of labour, 
there would be no sentiments of sympathy or goodwill, but only endless bloody fighting. And it's central to Hayek's description of the market as a catalaxy, a term derived from the Greek katalatean, which meant both to exchange and to turn from an enemy into a friend. For the neoliberals, and we find lines like this, defences of the pacifying virtues of the market throughout the neoliberal uh, figures. Now, for the neoliberals, the competitive market was not simply a more efficient technology for the distribution of goods and services. It was the guarantor of individual freedom and rights and the necessary condition of social peace. If neoliberal thinkers and human rights activists could find common cause, as I suggest they could, this is largely because the concerns of 20th century neoliberals were far less narrowly eco economic than existing accounts tend to allow. So what do human, neoliberal human rights do? The Chicago School economist Deidre McCloskey holds up the drafting of the UDHR as evidence that market capitalism promotes, in her words, the temperance to educate oneself in business and in life, to listen to the customer humbly, to resist the temptation to cheat, to ask quietly whether there might be a compromise here, like Eleanor Roosevelt negotiating the UN Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Looking back in 1966, Hayek was far less complimentary than McCloskey about the compromises that produced the UDHR. The document, he argued, was an incoherent attempt to merge the liberal rights tradition with a starkly different one derived from the Marxist Russian Revolution. So throughout the book, I examined the neoliberal understanding of human rights alongside the diverse understandings of rights and obligations that motivated the drafters of the UDHR and the two legally binding human rights covenants. Along with classical civil and political rights, these documents, as we know, enshrined extensive lists of social and economic rights, and in the later case, gave pride of place to the right of nations to self-determination. For the neoliberals of the time, these documents, uh, the UN human rights process, looked less like a model of peaceful market cooperation than like the globalisation of the collectivism that threatened at home. They believed that the attempt to secure rights to social welfare and national self-determination threatened the market order and civilization itself. But I also showed that despite their horror at the collectivism and politicization in their terms that characterized the human rights process in the UN, the neoliberals didn't simply turn away from human rights. On the contrary, they developed their own accounts of human rights as moral and legal supports for a liberal market order. Their efforts became particularly intense in the period of decolonization, as post-colonial states began to demand not only political but also economic self-determination. The neoliberals, neoliberals struggled to find a means to discipline post-colonial societies and secure their submission to the market and acceptance of their traditional places in the international division of labor. Now, according to the neoliberals, human rights were not naturally occurring. They weren't natural endowments of the human person. They were created only by the rise of capitalism. It was only capitalism, Ludwig von Mises argued, that made human relationships material and calculable and brought freedom from the heavens down to earth. Such freedom, he wrote, is no natural right. If the market order is the real basis of all declarations and right, of rights and charters of liberty, as Mises contended, then in his words, as soon as the economic freedom which the market economy grants to its members is removed, all political liberties and bills of rights become humbug. Like their Marxist critics, the neoliberals saw human rights as intimately bound up with the rise of capitalism. This was not, however, a laissez-faire version of capitalism in which the rights of man expressed the egoism and ec of the economic man of civil society. Rather, neoliberals were focused on creating the conditions for competitive markets, and those conditions were subjective as much as they were economic. So throughout the book, I show that the neoliberals of Montpellerin developed their own account of human rights. 
For them, human rights existed not so much to protect the individual as to preserve the market order. This neoliberal vision of human rights was at its purest in the period of neoliberal ascendancy. It was clear in Margaret Thatcher's simultaneous denial that state services are an absolute right, in her words, and her championing of what she termed a right to be unequal. We saw it also in Ronald Reagan's defence of human dignity as what he called the crowning ideal of Western civilization. The political theorist Michael Ignatieff expressed this vision clearly in 2001 when he argued that the civil and political rights of a so-called capitalist rights tradition are, in his words, the most we can hope for. And Hayek's student, the international trade lawyer Ernst Ulrich Petersmann, defended it most emphatically when he argued for the mutual reliance of human rights in international trade law. The globalisation of human rights relies on the open markets prohibition of economic discrimination and welfare-enhancing division of labour enforced by the WTO, Petersman argued, while human rights promote economic integration by protecting personal autonomy, legal and social security, peaceful change, individual savings, investments, production and mutually beneficial transactions across frontiers. Yet the neoliberal human rights heritage was not only embraced by figures on the right. I argue that this neoliberal background can shed light on the apparent puzzle that the human rights politics of the late 20th century, with its distinctive use of international advocacy to limit the power of the state, emerged, in Samuel Moyne's words, seemingly from nowhere. I show that organisations like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch and Medicine Sans Frontieres drew on an account of rights developed by the neoliberals since the 1940s. For them too, decolonisation generated a desperate need for new standards to constrain post-colonial states. They focused their attention on what Hayek argued was the complement of what he termed the taming of the savage. That was also, in his words, the taming of the state. The attempt to discipline post-colonial states held a much larger place in the new politics of human rights than did the concerns of the previous decades with economic welfare and self-determination. Although the human rights NGOs came to prominence in the context of the evisceration of social welfare protections and public services, these concerns rarely entered the frame of their early advocacy. In his major biography of the international human rights movement, Arya Naya, the former head of Human Rights Watch, suggests that the rise of human rights coincided with a shift of Cold War rhetoric from an economic competition between communism and capitalism to a political conflict of repression or totalitarianism versus liberty or human rights. I argue that major international human rights and humanitarian NGOs embraced a central neoliberal dichotomy between a commercial or a civil society understood as a realm of freedom, voluntary interaction and distributed private power on the one hand and politics understood as violent, coercive and conflictual on the other. They defended the same anti-political virtues the neoliberals attributed to the market, restraining political power, taming violence and facilitating just a margin of individual freedom. Like the neoliberals, international human rights NGOs embraced law to restrain politics while avoiding those social and economic rights that could only be achieved through political action, not judicial sanction. The methodology of many human rights NGOs, as Kenneth Roth, director of the US-based Human Rights Watch noted, consists in the ability to investigate, expose and shame, which involves identifying a particular violation a specific violator and a clear remedy. This has made these NGOs both reluctant, often reluctant, certainly Human Rights Watch is still largely reluctant, and unsuited to challenge the structural and impersonal effects of market processes. Yet while supposedly eschewing coercion, major human rights NGOs, including Roths, have been quite prepared to call on the military might of the most powerful states to intervene in the name of securing human rights and universalising a distinctive moral order.
In the process, they have often aligned themselves with the neoliberal embrace of a strong security state to protect the market and enforce the morals of the market across the globe. Then, as today, the content of human rights was a product of political struggle. Human rights are not given by nature, and there has never been a single human rights movement capable of securing general agreement about a list of rights and their order of priority. What I call neoliberal human rights are not the only form of human rights to have existed historically. As many scholars have pointed out, and as I show in detail throughout the book, social democrats, socialists and anti-colonialists used the language of human rights throughout the 20th century for ends that were at odds with neoliberal perspectives of the period, including in the campaign for social welfare, national self-determination and racial equality. Nor do I claim that today's human rights campaigns necessarily further neoliberal ends. Yet I do contend that the neoliberal contribution to human rights has been far more widely influential than most contemporary human rights defenders would like to admit, and not only on the political right or in the halls of power. Without coming to terms with that influence, social movements and struggles that wield the language of human rights to contest neoliberalism may find themselves strengthening its hold. So the story I tell in the book is the story of how neoliberal thinkers made human rights the morals of the market. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica. That was uh, a, a wonderful uh, summary of uh, an excellent book, which I, I do recommend. Um, so can I ask, uh, colleagues and uh, participants to use the reaction button. Did you want to come in with a comment or a question? And uh, we'll spend about uh, 25 minutes on our discussion, if, if you want to do that. And maybe while you're thinking of a of a, a, a question, I suppose in my own mind, um, I know you addressed the uh, I suppose the, 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 the this issue in your closing remarks, Jessica. But I wondered if there is evidence that the human rights organisations practitioners have begun to incorporate some of the the, the critiques that you have identified and begun to both acknowledge the limitations of human rights discourse and maybe reassert the need to embed the pursuit of civil and political rights within the attacks on structures, especially not only in a world that's now marked by feudal levels of inequality, but given the challenges uh, to capitalism presented by the ecological crisis, the multiple ecological crises. Mm. Could you comment on that briefly? Yeah, sure. Thank you. I think that's a really important question. And I think there certainly have been changes. My book ends really in the sort of like fall of the Berlin Wall type period. So it really goes up to the late 80s or the mid 80s, in fact, really in terms of the case studies, uh, but then has a postscript or a um, conclusion which looks much more at the contemporary period and I think certainly we have seen real shifts many of the NGOs I look at have taken on questions of social and economic rights in particular much more than they had earlier Amnesty International distinctively I mean it changed its mandate to allow it to take on a much broader set of questions um, I think also a, a significant development was say, the appointment of Philip Olston as the UN's um, Special Rapporteur on Extreme Inequality and Human Rights, which I think he used that position to really try to bring attention to the question of inequality. Now, I have certain criticisms about the way he went about doing so and the way that certain human rights NGOs have dealt with questions of poverty and um, human rights abuses. There's a quote from Amnesty International where they say, 
Can all the hundreds of millions of people in the world who are subjected to poverty be considered as victims of human rights violations? And it sort of reveals something of the limitations of the way that a human rights violation is conceptualised when you start saying, oh, you have hundreds of millions of victims of human rights violations, as though you were going to deal with each of those cases individually. And I think in the case of, say, Philip Alston's work, he says at various points in written work, you know, human rights has, you know, the human rights movement should be ashamed of not taking seriously inequality, but essentially unless we do so, other people are going to take seriously the question of inequality using other languages so that the future of the human rights enterprise is at stake. Now, I think sometimes there's a tendency to be more concerned about the fate of existing human rights organisations than the effectiveness of political movements to combat inequality. And so, but having said that, I do think it's a real shift that there has been much more of a recognition from human rights, mainstream human rights quarters of the need to deal with questions of poverty and inequality since the period that I looked at. Right. And just to follow up on that briefly, um, I know you have an interest in development. Um, and, you know, what you're doing here in part is helping us to navigate the transition, especially from the, the post-colonial era into the development era. And, it, it, you know, when we talk about universal rights um, and the constraints, especially the ecological constraints and the constraints that are probably inherent in terms of distribution, um, it seems to me that a new language of uh, um, sufficiency is required within the discourse of development. Um, and that has a kind of an ontological edge to it as well in terms of what we expect, given that we are very much living within a, a development model, which is uh, in the image of a, a regional experience, you know, the regional privilege of uh, uh, North America, Europe, Japan, what have you. So there is an interesting boundary or, or um, encounter with limits that will have to be taken on board by advocates of social uh, rights alongside civil and political rights. So there's no, just an interesting conversation there, isn't there, for human rights advocates in the context of the limits that we're now encountering in the context of development. Yeah, look, I think that's a really interesting point. And certainly it seems to me that in a way, none of the models that I look at in the book, certainly not the neoliberal advocacy of competitive markets at all costs, which we're currently seeing that, you know, the same organisations, the neoliberal institutions that I looked at are now vehemently fighting against any action on climate change in particular to very, you know, quite devastating effect. It's very prominent in a country like the one I live in that essentially lives off digging various things, notably coal out of the ground. Um, but yes, also some of the post-colonial development models that in many ways I have more sympathy for, and I certainly have more sympathy for the forms of international redistribution that those um, defenders of that model fought for in the mid-70s, particularly with the new international economic order. But yes, I think clearly the climate crisis has forced a rethinking of development models per se. Yeah, our own uh, Sean McBride, of course, is one of the Champions yes. of the new international economic order. Yes, yeah, yes, absolutely. yes. Yeah, very, very interesting figure in the sort of intersection between an earlier sort of anti-colonial third worldist politics and a newer human rights style politics. So really fascinating. Yes, and I, I think his his uh, his geological sorry geopolitical positioning in Ireland as both a, a European identity and a colonised identity mm. informed mm. that uh, absolutely yes. and, uh, it's it's a it's it's a conversation that's re-emerging on the island I think in the context of a of our um, uh, discussions on the new economy and uh, mm. the, the rights of nature as a, a, mm. as a act of solidarity mm. with um, some of the post-colonial um, conversations in Latin America. Um, can I ask participants or colleagues to join the conversation?
I think I noticed something in the chat. I haven't, oh, I wasn't sorry. able to read it, but. My apologies. I, uh, um, I missed that. It's a, a, a comment from Connor. Many thanks for this challenging talk. It sounds like you think the neoliberal concept of human rights is a bad one. Is there a better model that you would like to replace it? Or are you saying it should be abandoned entirely in favour of something else, uh, something more socialist in its political foundations, perhaps? Um, so I, I suppose that's a, a, a little bit, a bit of a provocation for you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you. Um, yes, I certainly think that the the neoliberal influence on human rights has not been a a positive one um, and has led to a, a form of human rights politics which has been too uh, sympathetic to capitalist markets, has naturalised capitalism, has naturalised inequality and forms of poverty. And in the book I talk um, explicitly about um, the ways in which particular NGOs took up this position. So one of the case studies is Medicine Sans Frontier, which um, people may or may not know in the mid-80s set up a foundation or a think tank called Liberty Sans Frontier, which was set up explicitly to campaign against third worldism and particularly against third world as demands for global wealth redistribution and they um, worked alongside people like Peter Bauer, the neoliberal development theorist, to combat demands for the new international economic order, for instance, and to combat any kind of structural accounts of the poverty of former colonies. So um, I think that that was a, a not a good um, influence whatsoever. Um, I don't argue that all use of human rights language today is neoliberal, and I certainly don't argue that that has been the case historically. In, ca in fact, what I'm really interested in is conflicts over the language of human rights and the way that, for instance, for a moment during the period in which the covenants were debated and drafted, it was possible for numerous former colonies to impose their own priorities on the documents, even if they couldn't necessarily impose their own priorities on the realities of international politics. Um, so, but I do think today, on the one hand, I think that there's been some really important work that's been done about um, poverty and inequality using the sort of human rights language more recently. But I also do think that I think my preferences are for opening up space for other kinds of political possibilities from the left that can be more explicit in challenging the structural or supposedly impersonal domination of capitalism rather than simply the individualized violations. Okay, we have um, a question from Lisa. Thank you so much for the presentation. You mentioned the limitation of the individual approach to dealing with social and economic rights. However, is there an alternative within the human rights discourse? Would approaching human rights as collective rights be a solution? That is, would this still be human rights in the sense they were constructed initially? In other words, if human rights NGOs eventually sustain the system of discrimination, is there a way out without abandoning the human rights framework? An interesting question from uh, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. Um, look, I think it's a bit similar to um, to what I was just saying then in the sense that I think that sort of two things are happening simultaneously. One is that human rights NGOs themselves are shifting. Um, I do see yeah. those shifts as sometimes being too limited as a result of the way that they still conceptualise human rights in essentially individualistic terms. Um, but I do think that there are numerous social movements that have used the language of human rights to demand more collective forms of rights, sometimes more successfully than others. There's also been a tendency um, that I have certainly um, 
I think is interesting but limited to conceptualise labour rights as human rights. I think my concerns about this is the way that it's tended, say, in the context where I am, where we've had our main trade union council run like election campaigns under the slogan, the right to strike is a human right. Now, one wonders what they think the power of calling the right to strike a human right is in a context, of course, it's important that people are granted the right to strike, but what that's tended to do is move away from the actual embodiment of that right to strike, where people have simply struck and imposed their ability to strike, to withdraw their labour in favour of moving the question onto a moral and legal terrain of arguing about what is and what is not a human right. So, I mean, I think there are lots of different attempts to find ways out, and I'm not arguing for some wholesale abandonment here and now of the human rights framework. I don't think that would be possible anyway, but I do think that it is um, valuable to think about possibilities to think differently about political possibilities outside of the purely human rights-based framework as practiced by major human rights NGOs. Okay. Uh, Teresa, would you like to um, just uh, say your point or pose your question to uh, directly to Jessica? Uh, Teresa? Okay, so Teresa is saying one of the issues with human rights is their uh, is their ju judicialization uh, and thus their link with limiting politics through law, as they also establish some forms of subjectification linked to the nation state. If the judicialization is seen as providing tooth to the movement, uh, in Sinkic's words, are we also uh, not missing something as a result? Um, can, can you see that question, uh, Jessica, on the chat? Yes, yes, I can. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, I think the this question of judicialization and limiting politics through law is something that in the book I discuss in the in relation specifically to Amnesty International in Chile in the context of the um, Pinochet coup there. Um, and I think this is really interesting. It was just as the book came out that there were the mass protests across Chile um, demanding a new constitution. And I was recently at a session on the constitutional convention and the movements to replace the Pinochet era constitution. And what I look at in the book is is the way there's been a lot of attention previously to the role of the sort of Chicago boys, the economists, in designing the, um, the military regime's neoliberal economic policies, but there's been lots less attention to the role of neoliberal constitutionalism and the very um, active and explicit role of figures like Friedrich Hayek and other members of the neoliberal Montpelerin Society in advising the regime and in deliberately attempting to ensure that a constitution was brought into force, which would mean that these reforms simply would be perpetuated always and forever long after the so-called return to democracy. So one of my concerns there in relation to, say, Amnesty and the other human rights NGOs is that when this constitutional process began, they essentially had this discourse, which Amnesty, for instance, stated quite explicitly that the coup was a product of political tensions and politics was just framed as this sort of amorphous zone of tension, as if politics was inherently conflictual and it didn't really matter what side or what people were fighting for in terms of political ends, politics equaled tension. And so given that the move to replace politics with law, with this new constitution, was inherently a positive development. And I think that what that meant, that really uncritical attitude to the legalisation of the neoliberal reforms, meant that 
these human rights NGOs were really defanged when it came to contesting the extreme inequality and neoliberal um, regime that persisted after the authoritarian regime, that persisted in the context of the return to democracy. So you had, on the one hand, a strong language of human rights um, in Chile, but you had this persistence of this neoliberal constitution, which ensured that the regime of privatisation, that the extreme austerity persisted. So one of the things politically that really inspires me today is the extraordinary efforts across Chilean society to rewrite that constitution and to finally be done with that neoliberal economic model. Whether they will, whether it will happen, it's still, you know, up in the air. There's a lot of forces against it. But it seems to me that yes, that that judicialization and the idea that somehow inherently judicialization is a positive thing, um, particularly in contexts where you had a very strong authoritarian tendencies within the judiciary, I think is a dangerous aspect of human rights. So, yeah, I do think we lose something to answer or we're missing something to answer your question. It's, it's very good news from Chile. It, it's a, a wonderful uh of the world to look to at the moment in terms of reopening the moral imagination around all of these issues, isn't it? Um, we have Helen Henderson, who's a member of the Human Rights Commission, who says, thank you, Jessica. What do you think are the critical actions that national human rights institutions should be taking to bring awareness to the neoliberal influence as well as contributing to more systemic change? Mm, thank you. Um, I mean, obviously, national human rights institutions have their own sort of constraints. Um, I think that some of the the work that Philip Holston did as UN Special Rapporteur on economic inequality was really important and provided something that I think could be taken up by national human rights NGOs, sorry, institutions, particularly um, in relation to highlighting things like tax policy as of relevance to human rights. I also thought that um, his report on the United States was very interesting because, because of the US's non-signatory to the Social and Economic Rights Convention, he had to frame all of his um, sort of critical remarks in the language of civil and political rights. And so I think he did a very good job of showing that high levels of economic inequality actually deprive people of their ability to realise civil and political rights, not just social and economic rights, that their rights to political participation, to fair trials, to due process, all of these things are compromised by high levels of economic inequality. So I think that um, highlighting some of those uh, dynamics is an important thing that I think national human rights institutions could play a role in. Brilliant. And we have a, a former uh, chair of the Human Rights Commission here in Northern Ireland, uh, Bryce Dixon, is asking, uh, he wonders if Jessica could say whether uh, you think neoliberalism has enhanced social and economic rights in China, and if so, has it been at the cost of enhancing civil and political rights? Yeah, look, thank you. That's a really interesting question. Um, I think, look, the question of neoliberalism in China, I think, is a complex one. Obviously, there were significant levels of market um, reforms informed in certain ways by neoliberal thinkers. Um, there's a excellent book that's just um, come out recently, people may have seen, by... Um, uh, Isabel, I think, Weber, just lost her name, but it's Weber on how China escaped shock therapy. And she traces in very high level of detail debates within the um, Chinese state and within various sort of economic bodies about whether or not to proceed with the kind of shock treatment that um, took place in Russia, for instance, um, following the fall of the Soviet Union. And she shows that um, the strong neoliberal 
position was sort of tried, um, interestingly modelled, in fact, on Chile in many ways, on Pinochet's Chile, uh, which is an interesting model for a supposedly communist country. Um, and that then um, after the Tiananmen massacre, they stepped back from this position and that generally China had a much more gradual form of price liberalisation, for instance, than, say, the Soviet Union did. So I think the question of neoliberalism is attenuated. Certainly China has lifted an unbelievable number of people out of poverty. And when, say, you know, the various international institutions talk about how many people have been lifted out of poverty under the neoliberal period, the vast majority of them, it turns out, are in China, which has not always played by the neoliberal playbook. Certainly, I think that the situation of civil and political rights is one that is um, not to be desired in any way. Um, I'm not sure whether I could say that it's directly the case that social and economic, the prioritisation of social and economic rights is the cause of the cost to civil and political rights. But I certainly think it's true that the Chinese state portrays itself as supporting social and economic rights and the right to development, for instance, above the importance of civil and political rights. I sometimes think that uh, uh, maybe another interesting example of that trade-off that Bryce is referring to is in your mutual neighbour in Singapore, you know, in terms of political rights and uh, mm. high consumer, you know, there's a bit of a, a trade-off going on, going on there. Mm. Okay, are there any other questions? I think that might be it. Um, I wanted to end, uh, if I may, uh, by asking you, what, what has been the most interesting and provocative response to your book? Uh, you know, has someone really made you stop in your tracks um, and think about something you've written, or maybe given it a, a new context? Which I might, I would imagine that you know people maybe coming from the ecological movement would would also be appreciating what you're you're trying trying to do here. But what what is the, the most interesting response you've had to the book to date? Oh, look, there have been so many. I mean, the amazing thing about the post um, COVID period is that as things have moved online, it's been actually much easier to do sort of international um, conversations than it would be otherwise because I couldn't possibly fly to as many places as it's been possible to sit in my kitchen where I am currently and speak. So I've got to hear from people in numerous different places. And I think, I mean, one of the things that sort of always interested me is just how much people have used human rights in so many different ways. And I also I often feel like people are asking, you know, but but can we still use human rights? And I think that people do and people do in a whole lot of extremely diverse ways. And so it's I guess meant that I've had to be more um sort of recognise that the critique that I make is like one part of a much bigger story and that people are doing either under the name of human rights or using other political languages and forms of mobilisation, really a huge number of extraordinary things to try to challenge the many deprivations, whether of what we could call civil and political rights or social and economic rights in this world that we live in. That was a wonderful answer. Uh, I see Lauren uh, typing. I'll just give Lauren a moment. All right. I, I think these are thanks, actually. So, yeah, thank you very much, um, Jessica. It's been wonderful to to finally meet you on my own my own part and to to share the conversation yeah. with our participants. I know that um, you know underlying your work is this concern around the closure of our moral imagination and you're helping us to navigate in a very nuanced way uh, some of the, the conversations that we all need to to have. I often say to my students that we we can only know the force of an idea or the strength of an idea by also understanding its limitations and its shifting contexts and I think you've done that in such a nuanced way in a very uh, beautiful way in your, your book so thank you for bringing your own moral imagination to our to our attention.
and uh, good luck with all your, your future work. Th thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. And thank you again for the invitation and to all of you for the really interesting and thoughtful comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who has taken part and uh, have a good day. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.